Patrick, API Fortress. Uh, yeah, it's me and Mark standing awkwardly over there. Cool, so I'm just gonna, it's a little bit different, the talk, but it basically has the same result than what was in the, what's printed on the, on the paperwork. It's, it's more, more SEO crazy title, but it's the same thing. We just thought it was a funnier title. So really what I wanna talk to you guys about is just the API testing in general. Not the sexiest topic, but it's one that it's interesting. And so what I'm gonna be chatting about is more specific to what we see today in terms of like all the customers and potential customers we talk to. So um, Richard Feynman sort of had this, I'm gonna paraphrase it, he had this thing about like, imagine you're telling a story. So I'm telling a story about my friend Steve fell on the ice and broke his arm and like we brought him to the hospital. And so like the thing that really comes down to is it depends on the person what type of question they ask. So if you're like a friend of both of ours, you might ask like, you know, you know how, how did it happen really? It's like, no, he just literally just fell on the ice. I know he usually drinks too much, but I swear, he just fell on the ice. And then if you're an alien, you might ask like, what's a hospital? I don't know what that is. You're just making stuff up. Then if it's a lawyer, they're clearly gonna ask like, who do you think's at fault? Is it a large corporation that owns the lands? That's just normal thought process. Then if it's a two-year-old, you just sort of get in the process of like, well, why'd they fall? Well, they fell because ice is slippery. Why is ice is slippery? It's that annoying sort of why, why, why that parents think is cute, no one else on earth thinks it's cute. That's the two-year-old. Like, so, that's, so it really sort of depends on what your position is to understand like what they're asking. So how it applies to software testing is when someone asks like, does, does our thing work? This thing that we're building, does it work? And you know, as I was saying, like it's just about like, who are you? That's how you decide whether it's a yes or a no as to whether it works. And so let me use a real life example. This is back when I worked at a company called UsableNet. Has anyone here heard of a company called UsableNet? No, this is hilarious to me. So we built the first mobile websites. So all of you have used, like we had every airline, every hotel, 1-800-Flowers, Macy's, Bloomingdale, Chanel, Tesco, Walgreens, we had all of it. Not one of you knows who they are. So it's one of those things that I worked there for like three years and we all thought like we're gonna have a killer resume. Sounded like we made stuff up, like we're nobodies. Like we were building branding guidelines and like, oh, shopping cart, top right, and did all these things we thought were changing the world. Like, yeah, maybe, but everyone else just took credit, it's fine. So anyway, um, I worked at this company called Usable Event. We were building this mobile website for, this was back, by the way, remember mobile websites, you had to do this, because it was a full site, so you had to do this to scroll in. This was, well, 2007 or something. So this was a company, they sold skater clothes, like, and we were building their mobile website for them. And so we ended up with this like, scenario that was fascinating. So I'm using that example here to sort of describe you know, what I opened with. So let's say like unit testing. So you're the developer, you're looking at this like, bit of code that you wrote, and you look at it and you think, all right, I'll build a unit test for this, and this piece of code I think seems to work pretty well. Uh, you know, if there's a 30 or 50% discount, it works perfectly. But then like, outside of that, like, what about 31%? Like you sort of immediately see like, you know, there's, there's some gaps here. It's not perfect. It's not as great as you think. Like, you're undefeated at doing 30 and 50%, but there's more nuance to it than that. And so then you, then you go to the next phase of, like, testing. You go, like, the front-end tester. Well, the front-end tester is going to download the mobile app or the mobile website, and they'll be like, can I click the buttons and check out? Yeah. Nailed it. All right. My job's done. I, like, I did some great mobile website testing, and it's really achieved a lot of things. And so this happened to us all the time. Like, we did mobile websites, and so we had like mobile QA experts, had a whole team of them, and they would test things, and everything seemed great. And then push came to shove, and that's when we ended up seeing things like this. So this was the, I mean, we copied and pasted, it's literally how you would add something to cart. It was through an API call, and it would be a post to add to cart. So does anyone sort of see the issue with what this little bit of code is here, this little post? No, that's fine. You could define your own discount in the post. So we literally were buying shoes with a 100% discount and getting them delivered repeatedly. But everyone was pat every test passed, like the unit testing was passed, like all these other things passed, but for some reason the person building the Add to Cart API had this scenario whereby you can just edit this thing. And so what's funny to me is like I have this huge thing that makes me, well first I'll just say this, like you know, what really is the takeaway, you know, APIs are very open. They don't push you down a specific path, so the capability to mess things up is much stronger. 
it's not rocket science, you guys all understand that. But what makes me laugh, and I have like this little hobby of mine, this finding, I read a lot of like hacker things, like oh this thing was hacked, this thing was hacked, then you read what happened, and so, so many of them aren't actually hacks at all, they're just stupidity, and it's amazing. So like this was one that we wrote about recently, and it was just a utility company, so India, uh, what's the name of it, it was called like Adhar, Adhar is like, keeps track of a billion people in India. They have an API. They were giving it to this utility company called Indane. Indane, yeah. So it's this API to help you like create an account, validate the person has like good credit and all that. So like Indane needed Adhar's API. Problem is it was publicly available and it had no throttling. This isn't a hack. I mean, this is legitimately just found the call and you just started guessing numbers and there's a billion people on it. So you got a lot of hits. Then you know their personal information, like some health history about them, credit history. This isn't a hack, this isn't rocket science. The United States Postal Service had something similar. Like their thing was just like, oh, if you search by a wild card, you just get everything. Wow. <laughs> but like what's amazing, it's like, oh, USPS was hacked. There's no hack, it's a, add a wild card. <laughs> it was just like you use like an existing token, like it was just, it's a crazy thing. So if you start reading about these like, oh, this was hacked, and usually just read the title and you move on like an Onion article, if you actually are bored enough, like I am on occasion, you actually go into it and read it and you start seeing that it's, a lot of it is just functionally based. It's just, it's not as hacky. A lot of it is just like some basic fundamental testing. And so this might be kind of obvious to everyone, but like at API Fortress, we have a lot of people that come to us and they actually ask us like, what would you suggest for API testing? So I'm just gonna go through high level. This will all, this will all be shareable, so you don't have to like take screenshots or pictures of the, I always find that weird. Who actually uses those? It's like a video of a rock band. Like I'm gonna take a picture of like this screen on the PowerPoint, I'm gonna transfer that immediately to my notes, straight in my Evernote, we'll see how that works. It's like just a normal workflow that we always suggest for people is just, the person writing the API also writes some functional tests for the endpoint they're creating. Good start. Committed to Git, that's great, so publicly available. But then the QA should always be involved. And here's the part that's a little nuanced and why like we deal with a lot of startups Basically, we don't even talk to startups because they all think they're perfect. No startup is not a genius. Like, we only have one QA, but he's an automation expert, and so no one, no one else is needed in my 10,000 person company. We have one automation expert, we got it. So I deal with this all the time. So now we, we talk to banks, we don't talk to like the, the whatever, 120 person company. Because they think like, no, we, got, we don't need QAs. We're anti-QA. Like, okay, well I'll talk to you in two years. Because they always come back eventually. And so it's just, it literally goes into like, you need this QA to do what? Integration tests. It's so like, you're a developer, you're writing a functional test for your endpoint, you're doing the same. What about, APIs are about a whole user flow, the, how they connect, do they actually connect correctly? It's so like one example I have is, is um, uh, Penguin Random House, they actually, damn, that's on video. Random book publisher, <laughs> random book publisher, they had an endpoint that gives you all their product IDs, all the things that are still in print they're willing to sell, it was a partner API. Then they had another endpoint that you look into the product details of those. So they would test both, they would get a 200, they thought everything was great. So then we came in, we showed them how to create an integration test, so what we did is with them we created like a data-driven test. So literally the first API call gave you a bunch of product IDs, then we would randomly choose 500 of them, go into them individually. And suddenly, every Monday morning from like 6 to 8 a.m., a bunch of things would blow up saying, this, this product doesn't exist. It's like, how is that possible? We just got the API call telling us all the products that exist currently. Long story short, and this is the part that's always interesting to us, is like API errors are sometimes just small, stupid things. This is just, they had an API manager that was cached, and they would redo their database of like products like Monday morning at 4 a.m., but then for like four hours, the cache wouldn't reset. Who thinks of that? Probably a lot of you, but not all of you. Like that's just the stuff that happens. Like, and then just this is a good thing. Automating is always good. So anyway, I'm just going to go through like some high-level best practices for like API testing. Sort of going into what I'm saying about like by doing these things, you can overcome some of the issues of that bi that bias of who are you and what are you testing. So specifically with like the basics, it's pretty simple. You test it, you wanna create a test for every endpoint minimum. You wanna test everything, including the header. The header is a lot of useful stuff, more than status code. There's, you know, there's response type, con content type, there's so much other stuff in there. Then testing every single object, all right? That's pretty easy, you probably already are doing that. But then the more advanced stuff, 
Variableizing your tests is really important because you can have one test, reuse it against any environment, not have to reproduce the test. So if you have four tests of the same thing and you update one, you have to update the other three. So making it reusable to any environment is really, really powerful, really useful. Then it's the next stage beyond just like contract testing or testing the objects. It's actually validating the business logic. So the example that makes the most sense when I explain it to people is like a retail. Every shoe, every pant has a size object. The range is very different. If you have a dress, the range is different than like shoes that are like two to 22, pants 28 to 48. And like, these are all different ranges, but this is the level of testing you can and should get into when it comes to an API, because you'll find things that are just crazy. So my co-founder and I were building a, building a thing for a large, it was like a Macy's in the UK. They had everything. And there was this like weird screw up in the API that was actually including mounting instructions for any product. And they sell cakes and stuff. So you bought a cake, you would actually like on the mobile app get mounting instructions. It's amazing. So that's the sort of stuff, like validate the business logic. If it's a cake, no mounting, we're good. And the data type seems pretty obvious. Phone number validates a real phone number. URL validates a real URL. This stuff isn't crazy, but you can't believe how often people don't do it because people are struggling just to keep up. Like the reality of what I do, I'm in the QA field. I'm trying to sell people that can't hire enough people and keep getting their budgets cut. That sucks. So like the tough part is they're just trying to like keep up constantly and they're not having the opportunity to add this level of nuance. And so that's why like I always tell people like, just see if there's another choice you can make about like what you're doing because you might be doing too much manual work. Like what you're doing now might require too much, too high a level of effort for you to be able to get to the creative aspects of your job. Because the stuff I was telling you about in the basic stuff, you push a button and a machine could generate that for you in like a lot of platforms today. You shouldn't be wasting your time on that. The next one, dynamic data. I spoke to it with the random book publisher example. Then integration end-to-end -end testing. Again, like actually going through a whole user flow. So we do that with UI testing, but we don't put that same level of effort when it comes to APIs. When many platforms have all the APIs necessary to like cr create user, search, add to cart, check out, you can do all of that stuff. You just gotta be careful when you check out. I built a mobile website for Shop NBC and created that whole flow as my first ever mobile website. And I bought 21 TVs over, overnight and they were almost shipped. Like we had to stop at the last minute. It was like my first month there. Anyway, usable net. You never heard of them, so who cares? <laughs> then confirm the response matches the request. This is a big one, especially if you're dealing with like PSD2 and banking. Like if you're asking for personal banking information, the person you want is the information you should get. It seems silly, but these are the sorts of errors that occur. Like a lot of API errors aren't even the API itself. Like it could be live user data. So like one example I gave at the uh, Nordic Summit like two years ago is Etsy. So who here has heard of Etsy? Brooklyn, hipstery, baloney, yeah. So if you want a hat with a beard built in, that's Etsy. So like they actually had this issue where they have an API, the API for all products, category is supposed to be required as per the spec. Then their website navigation team that does the homepage navigation, like the top tier navigation, they were using the API strictly as per the documentation. But then when you actually submit a product to be sold, it's a completely different team, just the website team. They forgot just to add that one thing requiring category. So every day there's about 3,000 items at Etsy that have no category associated and aren't cert that aren't findable unless you specifically search for them. That's like $70,000 of lost sales. Why? It's just that little red asterisk on, the web on that web page is missing. $70,000 a day but you can catch that with an API test, which is why like, if you really create a strong an API test, you can get around a lot of these biases of like, the person testing just what they're building. So, key takeaways, test everything, test smart, test constantly. This one I'll stop on because monitoring is funny to me. So, this is probably TMI, but like API Fortress originally was a cloud monitoring platform, functional uptime of your APIs. None of you bought that from me. Nobody wanted that. So then we started hearing more and more, and everyone's like, oh no, it's great, love the cloud. You have to be on our cloud. I'm like, all right, well great, now we're a container, mostly containers. All right, makes sense. And then everyone's just like, well, we wanna innovate faster. We have all these buzzwords we have to do. We have to do Jenkins, innovate faster, so we care about CICD. Makes sense, that's awesome. Like, use an execute on API, and you have your whole regression suite just before you go live. But why aren't you also using that same test to monitor? 
like an entire like user behavior flow running against your live environment every five minutes. Like people are like, oh, I don't want to create all that fake data. It's one hit. You're probably working at a large company. It's one hit every five minutes or even once an hour. You can know what your functional uptime is. So there's a huge difference between uptime and functional uptime. And that's the thing that like people are just always missing. Then standardizing. Um, this is something to keep in mind. It's all a choice based on your company, but this is a lot of the stuff we, we come into a lot of sticky situations with large companies where it's very siloed, meaning like they'll have maybe one tester with a group of five developers, let's say three testers. One person's using Postman, another person created something rest assured, and a third person has been on maternity leave for two, for two months, and no one really knows what that person was doing, because a lot of times when you're building your own thing, you're not documenting it super well, because that's just how life is, you, everyone's busy. So that's something to keep in mind when you're trying to figure out what you want to do for a testing strategy. You want to do something that you can actually like unify and work. So if someone disappears on you, that's why CRMs exist for sales team, because salespeople are always quitting or being fired constantly. We need a CRM to see what notes, what have they been sending, and how much have they not been doing. It's, that's, the sort, that's the same level of like transparency you should expect out of like your testing program. And so making the right choice and just forcing everyone to use it and stick to it can really save you a lot of effort. And I know that just because of all the people that we've been, we've been working with and helping to solve this. Uh, this is the one slide you might care about, although I think they'll show in the Nordic page. Uh, this deck has like notes and stuff. And then the ebook is about nine examples of API errors that are not something you would initially consider because it's crazy. I'm just about done. And then, yeah, that's it. The rest of this deck is more about like the right choices when making like choosing an API platform, but you can see the deck for yourself and that's just too one-sided. So that's it for me, I'm three minutes early just for you. And because everyone probably has their suitcases and is waiting for a flight at 4.30. So I'm done three minutes early. My name is Patrick from API Fortress.